Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you lovely lads and ladies around the world. And today we take a trip back down to the dunes of Egypt, where we uncover the reign of perhaps the most well-recognised and most famous pharaoh of ancient Egyptian history, Tutankhamun, or as he is otherwise known, King Tut, and also the reign of his successor, I. First, however, we must return to the year 1336 BC, the time of the death of the battiest boy in town, Akhenaten. At this current moment in time, the absolute bin fire that was the reign of Akhenaten had just served to squander centuries of building of prosperity, progress and dominance by the Egyptian Empire over the Eastern Mediterranean and much of the Bronze Age world. This era of social, political, economic and religious upheaval in Egypt, however, does not end with the death of Akhenaten. This era is known in particular as the Amarna period, named after the capital that Akhenaten had built to perhaps reflect his extensive changes enacted under his reign. Next in this particular line comes the pharaoh Smenkare, of whom very little is actually known about his reign. The only concrete information about this pharaoh's reign is that he reigned from the year 1336 BC to 1334 BC, compared with some other pharaohs a rather short reign. And the reason why the details are particularly lacking around Smenkare's reign could possibly be the result of the destruction of records, information and artefacts concerning the Amarna period by successive pharaohs, meaning that we are even unsure of Smenkare's origins, whether he was a brother to Akhenaten or whether he was Akhenaten's son, we just don't know. So in 1334 BC, Neferunaferuaten takes the throne of Egypt. And with this figure, we have a considerable amount of speculation as to her identity. Yes, we have another female pharaoh. And as far as modern scholars are concerned, Neferun Neferuaten has two possible identities. Those being Meritaten, the possible consort to Pharaoh Smenkare, or Nefertiti, the consort to Akhenaten himself and of whom you've probably heard of. Her representation can be seen in this bust here, and might I add, it is the best preserved bust of ancient Egyptian royalty yet found. But now here comes the moment you've all been waiting a bloody long time for. For now we move on to 1332 BC and the ascension of Tutankhamun to the throne of Egypt. A first peculiarity to note about good old King Tut, however, is that his original name was not Tutankhamun. His original name from birth was in fact Tutankhaten, a name, as you can guess, was chosen by his father, Akhenaten. Perhaps he changed it to try to distance himself from the bin fire that was the reign of Akhenaten. Either that, or his advisors told him to do it, seeing as there is a reason why Tutankhamun is often known as the Boy King. Upon his ascension to the throne in 1332 BC, Tutankhamun was only a boy of nine years old, which may imply that his advisors perhaps held more sway over the throne and governance than Tutankhamun himself for much of his 10 year reign. And these advisors kick-started the party with sweeping reforms aimed at restoring Egypt's original religion, works of art, and the reopening of temple sites across the Egyptian empire. That's right, Amun-Ra was back in business. Which is also why the reign of Tutankhamun is often slated as the end of the Amarna period of Egypt, for monotheism was once again set aside for polytheism within Egypt. 
meaning that Akhenaten's legacy really isn't all that huge, and is why some of the information surrounding the pharaohs, their reigns of the Amarna period of Egypt, are quite lacking in some areas, because it seems that successive pharaohs wanted to distance themselves from this era of Egyptian history as much as they possibly could. And speaking of becoming distanced, circa 1329 BC, Amarna or Akhetaten was abandoned, leading to Thebes becoming the capital of the Egyptian Empire once more. Whereupon the tradition of building additions to the temple site at Karnak was once again reinstated. Where it's said that under the reign of Tutankhamun, a lavish palace was built near the site at Karnak, as well as a memorial temple having been constructed in Thebes itself. However, both of these constructions are now largely vanished. And speaking of things vanishing, what happened to the monotheistic faith that Akhenaten had instituted? Well, in small ways, it still existed under the reign of Tutankhamun, however, there was no proscription or persecution of followers of the cult of Aten under the reign of Tutankhamun. And with that, we suddenly approach the year 1322 BC, and the death of the boy king Tutankhamun. By this time, he was at the age of 19, and so perhaps by modern standards considered as the perfect age to begin ruling by himself. Unfortunately though, he never got his chance. For in this year, it's uncertain as to how he died. Examination of his mummy suggests that he may have died either from malaria, a degenerative bone disease, or perhaps a head injury, perhaps caused by a chariot accident, some theorise. Yet despite there being perhaps not a huge amount of information on the details of Tutankhamun's reign, how is it that Tutankhamun is so famous and so well recognised, as opposed to other pharaohs such as Hatshepsut or Tuthmosis III? Well, the answer to that question comes from his tomb and burial. For in the year 1922, an extensive excavation of an area known as the Valley of the Kings in modern-day Egypt was carried out under the archaeologist Howard Carter. This excavation led to the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb, of which, it has been noted, was the most intact tomb of the pharaohs found to date upon its discovery in 1922. At this discovery, a wealth of artefacts were found, including an 11 kilogram solid gold burial mask found within the sarcophagus of Tutankhamun himself. This mask is even studded with precious gemstones such as lapis lazuli. However, there may be yet another reason why Tutankhamun is so famous. And that is perhaps because of the rumour and popularisation of the Pharaoh's curse. This is a concept that has been prominent in popular culture ever since this excavation, perhaps because of the deaths of those associated with the opening of Tutankhamun's tomb, particularly those who first set foot within the tomb upon its opening. A medallion was even found within the tomb to contain the inscription warning that death shall come on swift wings to he that toucheth the tomb of the king. And merely five months after the opening of Tutankhamun's tomb, one of the funders of the expedition mysteriously died. For now though, let's move on from supposed pharaoh's curses and on to the reign of Tutankhamun's successor. I. No, not me. I. When Pharaoh Tutankhamun died unexpectedly in 1322 BC, his lack of an heir to the throne created a brief power vacuum within the royal court, which was quickly filled 
by Tutankhamun's chief advisor upon his death, I. This means therefore that I's succession to the throne was not as a result of the will and testament of Tutankhamun, but instead more of a power grab on I's part. Meaning that raises the question, was he ambitious or was he simply power hungry? I'll let you decide that one. As for the details of Ai's reign, he simply carried on a lot of the policies that had already been enacted under Tutankhamun, namely the re-establishment of Egypt's ancient and complex polytheistic religion. And no, there's no smashing of Akhenaten stuff just yet. However, it wouldn't be long before this would start, for upon his succession to the throne, I was already in old age, and he in fact died in 1319 BC, having ruled for only about three years, meaning that perhaps the only notable thing that Ai's reign is known for is the continuation of the policy of the reinstatement of Egypt's polytheistic religion. But then again, we once more face the problem that after Ai's reign, a lot more artefacts and evidence get smashed up and destroyed, most notably by Ai's successor, Horemheb. But that is a tale for another time, for Ai's reign came to an end in 1319 BC, and with him ended the last ebbs of the Amarna period, for after this date, a lot of the evidence of this wacky time in Egypt's history is destroyed or lost. Meaning that despite Tutankhamun's efforts to distance himself from the reign of his father, he and I, as well as other pharaohs such as Smenkare, Neferu Neferuaten, and indeed Akhenaten himself, all fall victim to the destruction of information regarding this time in Egypt's history which is why there are considerable gaps in our knowledge surrounding this time in the late Bronze Age Near East. So there you have it, the history of the aftermath of the reign of Akhenaten concerning his successors Smenkare, Neferu Neferuaten, Tutankhamun indeed, and I, who was uh, 